Thanks for checking out our game. We're a small team of industry veterans who've all taken a big pay cut to work on our own game. Because we felt we had something innovative with a theme we personally cared about. I was the first employee I started a little over nine years ago at Guillaume, the studio head's house. I've been making games for almost 30 years professionally, but I'd known Guillaume. Uh, we met in Toronto working at another company, and he asked me to come be the design director for We Happy Few. I'd like to welcome Guillaume Provost from Compulsion Games. Compulsion Games. Hi, we're Compulsion Games, and we'll see you at PAX. Compulsion was founded in 2009 by Guillaume Provo, he's our studio head and founder. He began the studio with this idea of building a place where we could make creative, interesting games. Every game teaches you how to make that game. So by the time you're done, you know how you should have done it. When we started We Happy Few, I don't think any of us really anticipated that five years later Microsoft would call us and say, hey, do you want to be a first party Xbox studio? How much were we expending? Little by little, we added more people and it was like a train that we couldn't stop. It's funny because sometimes people ask me, uh, you know, they, they'll put courage on me for starting a studio and I laugh at them and I said, well, I kind of started it by accident. <laughs> Tell me about you and your company and who the hell you guys are. I'm the studio head and founder of the studio. Originally, I didn't actually set out to start a studio. We're an experienced team. Uh, we're, we followed our, our passion. Got approached by this Taiwanese conglomerate in Taipei who wanted to start a studio in Montreal. Everything looked like it was a really good deal, it was a really good salary, it was a really good concept. I got to start my own team, have tons of money. So I signed the contract, told everybody we were leaving, we quit our, we quit our jobs. Uh, and then uh, financial crisis happened. Where, but now it's official, we are in a recession. The, research and the money evaporated uh, just a few weeks before uh, moving. We'd set the ship to sail already to move to Montreal and start a studio, so we just moved to Montreal and started a studio just with no money. <laughs> when I was looking for work, I was applying everywhere and I applied to his studio, which on the website was a studio, and then I looked it up and it was a house. So of course I looked up this fellow to make sure he was credible <laughs> and it wasn't totally weird going to his house. And then I saw on his LinkedIn that he had like a million positive comments and he had all of this many years of experience. He definitely had the chops. So I lucked out in that, in this whole serendipitous thing. Compulsion was really a, uh, uh, a name that we picked as a desire for us to make games and something that we thought was, was a value that we wanted to explore uh, as the a compulsion of players to play the games that we make. I wanted to do art for games, but I wanted to work on more experimental stuff. So when I met Guillaume, it worked out perfectly because he was just starting his little indie studio and had this very creative project he was working on. Compulsion had been developing a game called Contrast for a few years. He basically founded the studio through that. In the very beginning, it was a lot of hard work. There was a main character. There was the main character's invisible friend. There were mechanics. Uh, there was no story. The main character didn't have a name. And so uh, I came on and we started batting around ideas. We eventually arrived at uh, a theme of fatherhood. I haven't thought about you in a million years. Well, but I guess I gotta remind you who I am. I'm just a wife and a mother now. Yeah, I heard you had a kid. We've been working really hard and we're really excited about where we are. He had we done a prototype and needed someone on the art side to bring an art direction to the shadow mechanic for contrast. And then we moved out of his house to a little office just down the hallway and 
a few other people joined the studio, so we were about five for a little while. And then we grew to about 10 when we released Contrast in 2013. And I had a lot of responsibility early on to develop the style for that. How do you feel you're pushing things forward with your game? We try to tell human stories, I think is the, the big part of it. It's not a story about um, getting the big sword and taking out the big majestic bad guy. That's not us. You need to use your shadow shifting powers to solve puzzles. Contrast shadow play is enchanting, but the spell is broken midway through its roughly five hours when the puzzles start relying on cliche ideas like moving boxes onto buttons to hold doors open. The reward is always another glowing orb or another box to help solve another puzzle. But the biggest puzzle is contrast itself. We had just finished our first game, Contrast, which is a narrative-driven puzzle platformer, and I uh, really didn't want to make puzzles anymore. I mean, it's an interesting genre, but it was a genre that was very uh, taxing from a, on a design standpoint and a creative standpoint, and uh, we wanted to do something that scaled a little bit more. We wanted something that was replayable, we wanted something that was roguelike, we wanted something that was easier for a small team to uh, create something memorable that would have value for players. And now, the catchy new song from our favorite new band. Have you had your joy, Ollie? People tend to forget about it, but we were actually a really small team. When we started, we had a few. There was just uh, five of us. We were making a game in the context of a team that was, you know, less than ten people. We were making a much smaller game at the time. I wanted to talk about dystopia, or wanted to treat a dystopian universe, uh, because we lived in happy, happy times. Um, you always want to kind of have an escape reality at the time. We Happy Few started as a project about. Uh, drugs, dystopia, denial in a procedurally generated urban setting. It was this idea of saying, hey, we want to build a survival game, we want to build something that is challenging and hardcore. And then on top of that, we thought, well, what kind of survival game would be interesting? We thought, maybe we will set this in a city, which is not where a lot of survival games are set. Guillaume wanted to do a game with uh, happy drugs and happy masks. After some back and forth, our art director wanted to do something in groovy 1964 Britain. Oh. Hello. One of Guillaume's ideas, which was really fascinating, was the idea of a survival game, but it was a social survival game. So instead of collecting wood to make a fire, you have to survive in a society. And for me, this is one of the kind of ideas that led to being 1960s dystopian England because it reminded me of a bunch of cultural references that felt a little like that. We wanted to avoid really cliche themes like 1984 and grey concrete blocks and uh, moved into discussing a bunch of different things that we thought were inspiring like Brazil, uh, Clockwork Orange, we looked at a number of Aldous Huxley's uh, Brave New World was also a big inspiration in terms of having happy drugs and this kind of feeling of a society that would be happy while being in a weird kind of controlled dystopia. Like Hot Fuzz was an example, this idea that you have this sort of perfect town and then you have this dark underbelly and there's a sense of paranoia and there's this sort of pressure from everybody to be perfect. Try this easy test. Are you having a conversation that's bringing you down? Then one of the people who's talking to you is a downer. Our art director, Whitney, really ran with that at the time and felt like the 1960s in England was a good setting and timetable to kind of cover that type of feeling because it was a historical moment in time where the English stopped looking back towards the Second World War and were more forward-looking towards, you know, the race to space and the future rather than looking back. And it's a time where there was a lot more form over function, so there's a lot of creative elements that we could piece out together that kind of fit well into the, the, the mold of what we wanted to build. The 60s was like a, I, I just felt it was a really strong period for a dystopia. You have this great Doctor Who sci-fi influence from English 60s television that I thought was really fresh. And to my knowledge, it hadn't been pushed in games to the degree that I thought it could be. A lot of people have been exposed to some cultural element to some degree, whether it's kind of the 
the quaint English setting or the kind of mod 1960s or the kind of retro sci-fi element. I feel like, I just feel like there's a ton of crazy cool material to work with. Why do we bury downers 20 feet underground? Answer, because deep, because deep down, they're really nice people. <laughs> Deep down, yeah. <laughs> I think that's the best one of all. It really is. <laughs> this is a mood board showing a take on archetypal England with an emphasis on this sort of medieval influence, specifically in the palettes here and the signage and the clocks. I think time is gonna be a super important element. This is sort of pushing this sort of gritty industrial English tone. And then this one here is kind of the quaint, super gardeny, a little more lighthearted. No, for sure. And I think in the main game, we don't have a lot of very English, wild, on purpose gardens that I think will be nice. Yeah. And I think Emmanuel has been exploring a bit of that and just having like really juiced up wild feeling gardens, which feels way more English and less like French. When I joined the team, We Happy Few was still a sort of survival horror uh, hybrid. Um, these were extremely popular in the indie world at the time because you could make them economically without a large number of staff. Now, interestingly, uh, because uh, it was a game that was made by such a small team, we moved away from telling a lot of story at the beginning, and we wanted to have like this replayable, systemic, roguelike experience that you know a small team could do convincingly and kind of create an experience for players to enjoy. And that was really the, the genesis of what the, the the type of game that we were making. But very quickly, we discovered, hey. Um, Probably not scalable. This is not what the market wants. Uh, more and more games are including the better aspects or the more appealing aspects of survival games. Our competitors were doing it and they were all AAA. So to compete, we recognized that we had to craft a really memorable, unique world full of memorable, unique characters. Uh, so we started emphasizing story. Uh, and this completely changed the game design. The first time we showed our game to the public was at PAX 2015. And we had a very small booth. We're here at PAX East taking a look at a game that was recently just announced. We Happy Few. We Happy Few. So we're here to talk about We Happy Few. How's it going, Jim? Really well. And what we showed was a procedurally generated world, which didn't really have any story to it. And everyone went like, oh, Bioshock, we want to know the world, what's the story, this is amazing. Next we have the game that I'm quite possibly the most excited about. One of the most exciting games. We were told by a lot of you guys on Twitter or Facebook to check out this it's game. Just, at the time it was a prototype, more than anything. And I think people really liked it. And this helped us transition into our Kickstarter. All right, so basically look for it soon. That's right, we, uh, we, are, we are looking to make a Kickstarter campaign in eight to 10 weeks with the express purpose to gather like an initial set of people uh, in a community around the game to help us you know, really uh, narrow down the mechanics while we work on the story in the background. Awesome. All right, thank you very much, Guillaume. Thank you. At the time, what we were trying to do was build and experiment with this idea of open development, seeking feedback as we go. In order to do that, we thought, hey, Kickstarter might be a really great opportunity to reach people who really, really care about the project. Any Kickstarter is a, a huge gamble. You spend months preparing for it and you have absolutely no idea if it's gonna work. I'm, I'm actually sitting next to you already. Uh, mm -hmm. The camera would probably just be framing you at that point. Uh -huh. uh, and at one point, you know, we switch to uh, a camera frame for both of us. I'm going to write myself just some quick cue cards, so because otherwise I'm, I'm gonna, this is going to be a complete disaster. <laughs> now, our next guest is Guillaume Provo, head of Compulsion Games, and we like to play games, don't we? So please give a great Wellington Wells welcome to Mr. Guillaume, Guillaume Provo. Provo. Thanks for having me on the show, Jack. Tell me, Guillaume. Why make a game all about us? Well, we like England. Yes? We like the 60s. Yes, it is. Uh, we, we like a, a universe that uh, is a little bit darker this time around. And, uh, Wellington Wells has been uh, this alternate 
history where the, the England was actually invaded by the uh, Germans during the war. Ah, yes, but we don't like to talk about it so much, do Can we? Can I finish writing my cue cards? Because I, I just want to write my cue cards. I just want to write my cue cards. Yeah. I just want to write my yeah. cue cards. Yeah. I don't know. At least I get my talking points in order. So we were doing the Kickstarter uh, campaign. Uh, and things were going really, really well. And uh, uh, then came E3, which was like this weird, you know, it sucks all the vacuum uh, of attention. Microsoft kicked off E3 2015 with an exclusive look at Halo Star 5. Star Wars Guardians. Battlefront. Fallout 4 is coming out November 10th. So our Kickstarter flatlined. We definitely had a little bit of a moment where we were a little bit more worried. And really, the, the people who were backing the campaign really rallied to get more attention. Welcome back to We Happy Stop. Oh, Fuse. God, what are you doing up here? <laughs> and uh, we, we shot past our targets uh, uh, at the end. And really, it was kind of an incredible, interesting experience for us to just like understand that, yeah, actually, there was people out there that believed in what we could uh, do and accomplish and were interested in the type of game that we wanted to say. People were reacting and they were, you know, to things we would show and it confirmed what we knew internally, right? Stories great, you know, exotic, ex eccentric characters great, you know, strange devices that you learn to craft and use as weapons. Uh, also great, people love this stuff, so having a Kickstarter campaign um, was phenomenal in that way and certainly the fact that it funded development for as long as it did. Thank God, otherwise there would be no We Happy Few or we would have stopped when it was just a survival horror simulation. Anything else you'd like to, to tell our audience? <laughs> yes, actually. We, we worked really hard on this game and we're always on the lookout for more feedback. So if you like the project or you want to see more of Uncle Jack, Come join us. Help us make this game. And I'm afraid we've come to the end of our time. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Jeffrey Porpoise, the creative director of We Happy Few. This is Jack Worthing wishing you another fabulous day in Wellington Wells. And cut. First time in the telly. Yeah. Uh, yes. You were a bit stiff at first, but I think you warmed up and I think you did really well. Mm. Thank you, Jack. Okay. Good job. Thank you. Mm. Mm. From Kickstarter, uh, we engaged that, that community for a while, and that gave us like, an opportunity to really actually work with the community. We started doing community updates every week. Uh, uh, the team actually made over, I think, over 160 updates uh, to the community over the course of the lifetime of the, the project to keep people involved and also to get feedback from them over the course of the development cycle. Um, but we actually helped gather more momentum to actually get the attention of uh, a, a big player in the industry, which was Microsoft. That's really the, one of the first key turning points for both the project and the company, which is Microsoft actually signed us on a first idea at Xbox deal, which was a deal that helped us, you know, uh, uh, get some attention. We were approached by Microsoft and said, hey, do you guys want to be on stage for E3 2016? So we figured, okay, yes, of course, you know, that, that kind of exposure doesn't, it doesn't just come. It's just a fantastic opportunity. The, you know, community told us they wanted something. We had no money or attention or team to build those things. It's really a case of like figuring out how to make the egg and the chicken at the same time. It's been really the entire story of that project. We kind of played Jujitsu for a while and got some money. Uh, created five minutes of what that, we thought that experience could be and then went out big on the stage at E3 and showed it to millions of players online. Now, I'd like to welcome Guillaume Provost from Compulsion Games to come up on stage and show off a project that's going to be launching into Xbox Game Preview next month. Guillaume? And in that, those five minutes, we had actually gone out and realized uh, the type of story-driven experience that the players that we'd seen at PAX had told us that they wanted to experience in our world. It's really the moment where we we catapulted from being a small indie game to like a like a world stage first moment. That actually launched our early access campaign, uh, which then you know, funneled more money for us to actually grow the team and actually realize the vision that we had for the, the team after having it shown to the public for the first time. And after two years of like telling people this is the thing that we want to build, we finally had the team and the money to actually go and build it. One of the big kind of components that we were stressed out about is actually generating too much buzz for what we actually could deliver. Uh, 
dealing with a certain amount of buzz is great, but also make sure that you can actually deliver to the expectations that players have and managing people's expectations. That's a really, really intricate balance that's really actually hard to, to build because you want attention. If you don't have attention, nobody's going to play your game, but you also want to make sure that you're not sending the wrong messages or the wrong signals about what what's the scope of the game that you're making or what's the quality of the game that you're making and uh, make sure that the audience doesn't become disappointed when they actually start playing it. Yeah, so I figured like the reception uh, at E3 was pretty good on the, the story bits. I think the one concern is just to make sure that we manage the buzz so that we're, we're, we, we also clarify that we are not like a, a 200 man team uh, working on a hundred million dollar budget, but keeping that excitement throughout the, the early access phase. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good idea. I guess it just remains to be seen. <laughs> Will it work? So, <laughs> When we released We Happy Few on Early Access and we went on E3 and Microsoft showcased the game and saw this great, what we call the rat pinata moment. He did it! Gearbox noticed and saw that and contacted us and said, hey, would you be interested in a publishing relationship? And at the time we had thought, well, you know, we're still quite small, we're self-published, uh, do we want to go down that route? And Gearbox came to us and said, listen, we think you've really got something here, can we work with you to promote it, to help it grow, and to build the game that you want to build? What people want is quite different to what we were thinking. Um, and so, in order to try and respond to that feedback, we needed to grow the size of the game, ultimately, and make a bigger project. And when you're making a bigger project, it's, it's very scary when you're doing that alone. What Gearbox provided us was uh, a perspective and um, education and knowledge that we just simply didn't have inside the studio. So, basically, as you get bigger, you want to have great partners to work with to help you build your game. You know, we attracted a lot of attention, and then with it, player expectations. Um, we decided to make a bigger game, uh, much bigger than what we originally had. And uh, so the Gearbox partnership was a little bit difficult uh, because we received a lot of backlash for it. With the announcement of that partnership, we also announced that, you know, we were not making a $30 game anymore, we're making a $60 game. And uh, there would be a season pass, which, you know, is in, um, is in something that is loved by all the gamers. So that thing that the public, or mostly our fans, were taken back and very surprised by this. Uh, so yeah, it, was, it wasn't it was easy, for sure, internally. It, but it made so much sense for us to, to do this, you know. There's a lot of things that the public doesn't know. You know, we needed to do this in order to grow our team, in order to build a game that people wanted to play, in order to make a game for the studio to grow. It was the logical step to do, for sure. When you send a game out into the world, you are never sure what the reception is going to be. I've certainly shipped games and people went nuts. You know, I was like, great. You know, I did the best I could and you loved it. And for me, that's what I did with We Happy Few. I did absolutely the very best I could for that game from start to finish. Uh, and if people loved it, they were gonna love it. If they didn't, they, they weren't. One of the things that you learn as a writer is that all feedback is true and almost all solutions offered are wrong. When we released We Happy Few, it was after uh, four and a half years of development uh, and the release was mixed. It was a mixed release. We have a large number of people who were super excited, loved what we had built, but then we had also a lot of people who were saying, hey, I'm having issues with the game and I am unable to do what I want to do in the game. I can't enjoy myself. And that's obviously super disappointing um, for us as developers. Feedback that we got in the end from the game, I thought was pretty fair. Sometimes it's difficult to hear because you know it's feedback that you couldn't do anything about. We were pretty aware of a lot of its flaws. The toughest feedback was uh, ironically the same feedback that we had reached internally, you know, the same conclusions. There were bugs that we just were so difficult to fix that we knew about them and we just knew that we're gonna have to suffer with them and 
and, and then you feel bad because you know that you know people are going to see them and it breaks the immersion it breaks the experience you know people rightly point out that combat isn't as deep as it could be and you know the ai are either overly predictable or entirely unpredictable um, and that's fair. I think with the procedural generation meant that we couldn't predict even what we would find for bugs in a lot of ways. So there were always surprises, it's like whack-a-mole kind of. When you're making a game, one of the most important things that you can get access to is feedback. Now whether that feedback comes from a small group of players testing in your building, whether it's your team's feedback, whether it's your mum's feedback, uh, or whether it's the general public's feedback, um, all of those things uh, can really help you build a better game if you're listening. You have to interpret the feedback and figure out what is the truth there that uh, I can apply to what I'm doing. So you always have to interpret feedback. As a writer, I'll often find we put some lore in the game and people say, I really want to know more about this. And you have to know that the correct answer to that is great. If they want to know, that's great. They don't need, that doesn't mean they get to know. If you told them, they might like it less. Wanting to know is a value in itself. Not to worry. We'll get you back on your joy, and you can forget that anyone was ever screaming. You'll never be a downer again. The toughest feedback that we received on We Happy Few was probably that, that we had really wildly different types of people interested in the game and it's very hard to develop and respond to feedback if it's not unanimous. You can't please everyone. Like, we've sold hundreds of thousands of you know, copies of the game, which means hundreds of thousands of different people with different tastes. Uh, you definitely always have some certain individuals who say, hey, I, I thought we were making a really hardcore, procedurally generated, systemic survival game, and then you'd have these people who are interested in the story, they're like, hey, I want to experience the story, why are these stupid you know, survival mechanics in the way? And, that real kind of Frankenstein of trying to please too many people at once was, was definitely one of the things that I, I felt was, was difficult. And that's due to the changing nature of you know, the direction that the project took. Since the Kickstarter, uh, we opened the game to the community. They could play the pre-alpha, they could play you know, early access. Early access opened it up to everybody, not only our backers. And what we want is, that, is really to inform gamers about how we make games, why it's complicated, and why certain decisions have to be made. Knowing that there's a direction change that you would want to do for the game uh, that would have made the game better, but not being able to do that because that's not the game you promised your Kickstarter backers or that you promised you know, your early access backers. And we had a lot of people who say, hey, I don't understand why the world's procedural, for example. It didn't you know, make as much sense in the context of having a uh, story-focused uh, game experience to have a procedurally generated game, but it made a lot of sense in the context of our Kickstarter campaign. Wanting on the one side to be faithful to what we've promised the community we would build, but also seeing what would be the right direction for the team is one of the things that was super difficult for us to deal with in a kind of an early access, community-driven game development where we had made Kickstarter promises at the beginning. That tension was impossible to reconcile. I was thrilled with the game's reception. Uh, I was particularly thrilled that uh, British people liked it. Um, we were concerned that they might go, that's, you know, you made that all up, you don't know anything of us, but they kind of went, oh yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's, that's pretty accurate, yeah. The people who remain with us who are playing the DLCs are you know, very, very nice, loyal fans who, they love the lore of We Happy Few. They love the world we created and, you know, all of our characters, they mean something to them. And I think just talking with them about it is probably one of the calmer, nicer part of this whole journey. I think people really dug the story and the world and, um, felt that we took them to a place that they hadn't been before um, and gave them an emotional experience, um, I, I think we're going to do even better the next time. Hello. Let's have a look at you, shall we? What happened to your clothes? 
Have you been running through rose bushes? From the outside perspective, when I think when they look at compulsion games and we have a few and everything that happened, from somebody who hasn't followed our updates, uh, they will see a small indie company who sold out, you know, got published by Gearbox, putting out a game that had flaws in it, but from the internal, we can write a chapter about everything we did that informs the public why we did it, you know. And, it, and none of it has to do with selling out or being greedy or anything. It has nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with just our livelihood and the craftsmanship of the game and what the public expects of you. Every game teaches you how to make that game. So by the time you're done with the game, you know how you should have done it. With a project like We Happy Few, which to this point has now taken five and a half years, uh, we've learned an extraordinary amount. I think probably the most important lesson that we learned uh, is to make sure that the game we're making is in line with the expectations of the people we're making it for. I think we learned through We Happy Few what we're good at, what we enjoy doing, um, and it helped us kind of solidify our identity from a creative standpoint. We learned a ton about how to grow and build our team, how to work together better, uh, what kind of games we personally were interested in, what kind of games should the studio make. We also learned in We Happy Few that we needed more support in gameplay because uh, we were kind of lacking in that department and that was something that ended up coming out in, in the reviews. Looking back is, and having like 2020 hindsight is, is, is always pretty easy. The thing is, I don't know that I would have done a lot of things differently. We did the decisions that we could at the time with the information that we had. So we were lucky along the way to have a good time and be, be there at the, right, at, the right, at the right time, the right place for us to grow bigger with the game that we had. The final DLC story is where you get to finally win. Victoria Orr, the slave of duty. I would start with just like the basic, she wants to impress daddy with her attention to duty. Have you forgotten your joy? Yeah, so she's all about the duty. You all know, about idealizes. the duty, about the duty, about the duty. Yeah, and then it switches to the point where she realizes that Bing is really a coward. So she goes off the joy. Okay, so she goes off the joy and she She's discovers that Wellington Wells sucks. Everything has not been about duty. So that's where she goes, uh, fuck it, I have to burn the whole thing down. Yeah, and that's when she goes and burns the whole thing down. And then we have all the fun gameplay that they're gonna design and you're gonna blow stuff up and... Dinosaur battle! Dinosaur battle. I, I think want we a got dinosaur it. battle. Okay. Can we have a dinosaur battle? Okay. High five, okay. <laughs> I think our work here is done. The Victoria DLC, <laughs> is the conclusion of the We Happy Few saga, and it has been quite a saga. By the end of making We Happy Few, we kind of saw the engine that we would created, what kind of stories that could tell really well. When we got to the final DLC, it's kind of the culmination of everything that we were trying to do in the first place. It's, it's I feel, the game that we were trying to make. Truth is the enemy of happiness. It's very much like the base game in We Happy Few in the sense that it's a story about someone who goes off their joy and doesn't know what to do. It stars Victoria Banks, the, the girl that everybody knows even if you haven't played the game. She's the girl, you know, with the piñata who tells you to get back on your joy and who eats the rat. And in, in this one, she's, she's the main girl and she's the one who is off her joy now. Instead of focusing on survival-like elements, we're trying to tell a very linear, handcrafted story. We are exploring the story of a woman who's sort of the nemesis of the first character. Um, she's somebody who has stood for authority, and now she's on the other side exploring the world that she created. Have you forgotten your joy? <laughs> Why would you give me my joy? I think the player probably has wanted to tear down this ridiculous system of we happy few, and we all fall down has the opportunity to stab the system in the guts and watch it bleed. It's, it's 
you know, it's the grand finale, it's the end of it. It's the end of We Happy Few. We embarked on a quest, a quest to find creative teams that have the mastery of our art form. And we found innovative game designers, master storytellers, exceptional world builders. And now, I'm excited to welcome Compulsion Games to Microsoft Studios. So when we started We Happy Few, I don't think any of us really anticipated that five years later Microsoft would call us and say, hey, do you want to be a first party Xbox studio? Uh, I don't think that ever crossed our mind. They basically came to us and said, we want you to keep doing what you do really well, but now you have a budget. So we were like, okay, that's great. Let's do that. We have been told to keep making really weird just different things, so on the creative standpoint, it's just been all positive. Trying to maintain creativity inside an organization like Microsoft is not as hard as people think it is. Uh, it's really just about having a leadership group inside Microsoft that understands the value of creativity and creative games. We're spending a lot of time figuring out, do we think that we can raise the standards of quality of the games that we're building. Can we become a real first party studio? I think working with Gearbox prepared us to work with Microsoft in a lot of ways because we led them into our world and we learned to be very, you know, concise and precise with our feedback back and forth. Learning how to give and receive feedback is a really big part of an organization like Microsoft. Uh, when you're an independent developer, you do whatever you want. Ultimately, you're saying, hey, I'm, I'm, I am my own sort of thing. For the first time in a very long time uh, in my career, to be able to create without this cloud of impending doom about financing or studio politics, not having to, you know, carry those sort of twin albatrosses around, I think, um, are extremely liberating. Being independent is risky, it's scary, and it's, um, it's one of the reasons why I have a ton of respect for uh, every independent out there. Uh, when we were going throughout We Happy Few's development, we had to seek funding every year and a half or so. And what that does is it creates strange incentives about how you develop, because you're always thinking, what happens if it dries up? Now, as part of Microsoft, we don't have to worry about that. We can now know that we are supported. We can start planning a game from the beginning right until the end. And that's actually uh, removed a lot of the focus from you know, finding where we're going to find the next paycheck to actually concentrating on what is it that we need to make great games. I could be more forward-looking to look, what do we actually need in order, to, in order to actually succeed. And that's a huge difference from having a big backer like Microsoft that's allowing us our creative space and our creative freedom from being an independent developer that's uh, starving all the time and looking for money. Build the team not just for the next game, but for the next series of games. If everyone else is anything like me, I think they are preparing to do the best work of their careers. What a wonderful story. I hope you enjoyed hearing it as much as I enjoyed telling it. And remember, stay at home at night or terrible things may happen in the dark. We do come to the end of our time. Good night, all. You feel like it's made you a better studio? Well, I guess we'll know whether we're a better studio once we get out the next game, and people will tell us whether we're better or not. <laughs>